In this lecture, we're going to continue talking about energy resources, and I'm going to specifically focus on coal. Coal is the natural resource, the fossil fuel that powered the Industrial Revolution. Coal continues to dominate global energy consumption in terms of electricity production. And I want to make a few points in this lecture and then return to them in a future lecture just to emphasize how and why coal as a natural resource has become so political. So this was the question I posed at the beginning of the last lecture. Why do humans harness energy from Earth? And I showed you this figure from a book I read a few years ago. And again, without signing right or wrong, just a reminder, right, the amount of hours we spend per week doing housework has decreased significantly, right, from roughly 60 to closer to 20 hours per week over the last 100 years. And that is in large part due to the access to electricity. So if we look here at the access to electricity 100 years ago, it was close to zero. And access to electricity now in the developed world, certainly in the United States, is at or very close to 100%. And all of these machines that now do the work for us that we used to do on our own by manual labor, now those machines use electricity to do the work for us. I showed you in the previous lecture this slide that just indicates the tremendous growth in our consumption of coal starting in the mid-19th century around 1850-1860 and then in the 1870s, 1880s as Edison and others started building coal-fired power plants and then we had that famous game changer where President Grover Cleveland flipped the switch at the 1893 Chicago Exposition. Once people saw what electricity afforded them meaning the machines that we could plug into the wall, the lights that just operated because of some invisible current that flowed through that wall into the light socket. Everyone in the United States and the developed world wanted that electricity, and as a result, coal consumption increased. I'm not going to go into the details of how coal-fired power plants work. I just want you to imagine that when you plug something into the wall, on average, in many places around the world, certainly many places throughout the Midwest, the East Coast, the Southwest, Texas, other parts of the United States, at the other end of that electric socket is a coal-fired power plant, and coal is being combusted in real time, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year, and that electric current is flowing along lines, or wires, ultimately into your house, and my house, and that's what we plug into. You can look at how many coal-fired power plants there are in the United States, and this is that snapshot as of June 6, 2020. There are more than 600 coal-fired power plants in the United States. You can see fewer on the West Coast, and that's because on the West Coast there's a lot more electricity generated by hydroelectric and natural gas, which I'll talk about in uh, a future lecture. But if you look at the east coast of the United States and move into the Midwest, coal has dominated our electric power infrastructure for more than 100 years. And there are some very important reasons why, and I hope that you take those away from the lecture today. Here are the nearly 160,000 transmission lines around the United States. And again, on the west coast, many of these are connected to other forms of electricity production. You could ignore the kilovolts. The different colors stand for the total voltage being sent on each one of the individual lines. And I just want you to see the connections among all of us throughout the United States. And no matter what country you live in, if you have a centralized distribution system for electricity, when you plug something into the wall, if you're not living off the grid with solar or wind, then you're plugging in to an electric grid that connects you with everybody else in your region and as you can see in the United States connects you with everybody across the entire country. When we look at coal and I say that its primary use is to produce electricity that is conveyed in the figure here where the x-axis is from 1950 through 2013 and the y-axis is millions of short tons so just think no coal at the bottom, and increasing coal to the top of the y-axis. And the title here is U.S. Coal Consumption by Market. And what I want you to see 
is that the market for coal in this gray part that I'm outlining here is the coal that is sold to electric utilities. There is some, some coal that is still used for transportation over here on the left as I'm outlining. There's some that's still used commercially for purposes other than producing electricity. And then the bottom here, this black area, is coke or the amount of coal that's used from, from U.S. coal mines to produce steel. And then we still have some small amount of residential coal here in the middle of the 20th century, but you can see by effectively 1990, there's no individual home or business that's using coal to burn and produce local energy. So electricity dominates coal consumption. The second most use of coal around the world is coking coal that we use to produce steel. So if you think of here, we have the World Trade Center, the New World Trade Center in New York City. If you think about the backbone of our built infrastructure, all of our buildings, all of the rebar that goes into concrete sidewalks and streets, the backbone for our built infrastructure is steel. Steel is composed of iron and carbon. It's about 95-ish percent iron and typically 2 or 3 percent carbon depending on the grade of steel. And about 15 percent of the coal that is mined globally every year is used to produce steel. We can also look globally at all of the coal-fired power plants, and here is that snapshot as of June 6, 2020. So I showed you the map a couple of slides ago for the United States, the more than 600 coal-fired power plants in the United States, and also coal-fired power plants. Here's one in Alaska. Here's one in Hawaii. We have them in Canada as well, Mexico through Central America. We have a number in Chile and southern Peru coal-fired power plants in Brazil and Argentina. We have some in northern Brazil here. I want you to highlight, I want to highlight here coal-fired power plants in Europe, coal-fired power plants in South Africa, and something I'll come back to, notice the absence of coal-fired power plants throughout most of Africa. Now that's telling us many things, but what I want to simply highlight now and, and sort of plant the seed in your mind to come back to is the absence of coal-fired power plants here throughout most of Africa. It doesn't mean that people in Africa don't want electricity. It means that the type of electric infrastructure we have in the developed world does not yet exist in Africa. And the absence of coal-fired power plants gives us the opportunity to build the electricity infrastructure in Africa differently than our own lived experience. There's no need to build coal-fired power plants for reasons I've discussed in previous lectures and I'll go back through today. In your lifetime and my lifetime, the greatest growth in coal-fired electricity has been in Asia proper. You can see India here has a significant number of coal-fired power plants. You can see China and other parts of Southeast Asia have a significant number of coal-fired power plants. Here in Central Asia, both Russia and many of the former Soviet Union countries here in Central Asia, these areas built and in some cases continue to build coal-fired electricity infrastructure. And you see that here in terms of the statistics. So the two tables of data I've shown here are for regional coal consumption, the growth of regional coal consumption from 1980 to 2010, and I just want to highlight Asia, 403% growth from 1980 to 2010. And if I take you back to the concept introduced in a previous lecture, pollution transfer, remember that one of the results of the enactment of the Environmental Protection Agency, the Clean Air Act, and the Clean Water Act in the United States, those did require our manufacturing companies to reduce emissions within the United States. The same types of emissions regulations were implemented in the European Union and all of its member states. But another effect of all of that legislation to clean up pollution in our country and in the European Union was the transfer of manufacturing from the United States and Europe to Asia and in particular to China. And so when we look at these emissions, it's not a right or wrong, a good or bad. It's a situation where we have to attribute a significant proportion of the growth of these emissions 
to manufacturing products in Asia that are exported to the European Union and the United States. And again, on the right, we have the share of global coal consumption. And if we look at Asia, in 1980, Asia, all countries in Asia, all, including China, including India, they were responsible for slightly less than 25% of global coal consumption. As of 2010, that statistic was about 63%, and it's higher today. And you can see North America and Europe have significantly reduced their share of global coal consumption, and that is because in the United States and the European Union, the economics have led to the growth of other forms of electricity technology that I'll discuss. If we look at all forms of natural resources that we use to produce energy, and again, remember we're talking primary energy, and then we have electricity, which is secondary energy, Coal is the number two most consumed natural resource. And if you look at the time here from 1965 to 2016, you can see that coal significantly increased globally by more than double. The y-axis here is terawatt hours, and don't worry about memorizing the numbers here. Just see that in 1965, the amount of coal that was being used to produce electricity was less than 20,000 terawatt hours and as of today it exceeds 40,000 terawatt hours of electricity and something I highlighted in a previous lecture and was the major component of the modules you worked on in discussion look at the top here with the green if we imagine a world where we do not combust fossil fuels in any way shape form or fashion not for planes not for trains not for automobiles not for electricity then this green part of the energy infrastructure here, other renewables, and then we have solar and wind. If we don't want nuclear, which is what the proponents of the Green New Deal tell us we should also get rid of, all of this here in the top right has to replace all of these terawatt hours of natural gas and oil and coal. Now that doesn't mean we can't do it, but it's a challenge in front of us. Again, I've used the analogy of the Dallas Cowboys football stadium for a previous lecture. And if you calculate the total mass or volume of the annual global coal consumption, so this is all countries on planet Earth and all of the coal that we mine and combust for the purpose of producing electricity, it would fill the Cowboys stadium 3,000 times. And remember, Cowboys Stadium at max capacity is close to 100,000 people. These television screens up here that I'm circling, they're 80 feet in diameter from corner to corner. So it's a massive volume. And we currently fill it 3,000 times, which means that during this lecture, we are filling the Cowboys Stadium and combusting that coal to produce electricity. I, I mentioned in the previous lecture the concept of photosynthesis and how woody plants and trees grow by taking incoming energy from the sun and using that incoming energy to combine water and carbon dioxide from water, air, and soil. Coal is also the byproduct of photosynthesis, as I'll show you in the next few slides. And when we combust coal, you can see here's a blacksmith combusting coal all of the black here is coal. That coal consists predominantly of carbon and the reaction carbon plus oxygen, remember any combustion reaction has to add oxygen. Carbon plus oxygen equals CO2 plus energy. And this is an irreversible reaction. We cannot put energy back into CO2 to make coal. So once we combust car the carbon in coal that nature has made available to us by adding oxygen, that CO2 is irreversibly produced and emitted to the atmosphere unless we scrub it, which we are not required to do now, and it releases energy. And remember I talked about Churchill and energy density. So if we have a kilogram of wood and a kilogram of coal, just notice that coal is able to produce about twice the amount of electricity in kilowatt hours as is wood. And that's extremely important and in the next lecture, I'll talk about natural gas and oil, and I'll build out this table. But for now, in today's lecture, just remember that wood and coal, when you compare them in terms of 
the amount of electricity that each can produce, coal is twice as efficient as wood. So where do we get coal? How does it form? So here is a highway that you would drive on if you leave Washington, D.C. and drive to Western Maryland towards Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And you can see the highway down here with a truck on the lower right for scale. And all of these are what geologists refer to as sedimentary rocks, meaning that at some point in their past, they were loose sediment. Think of that as beach sand that you might have under your toes when you go to the beach or you walk along the edge of a lake or the mud that you might squeeze between your toes if you go swimming in a pond or a river or a lake. This black rock up here at the top is coal. And that's the coal that gave rise to the Industrial Revolution on our side of the Atlantic Ocean, in this part of the Appalachian Mountains, in the mid to late 1700s and early 1800s. This was, as I've used an analogy previously, the low-hanging fruit that we had access to at the surface. And geologists today know very well how coal forms naturally. It starts out in an environment like this. So if you look at the inset top left, all of the blue here are all of the streams and rivers that flow ultimately to the Mississippi River, which starts out here in Minnesota. And the Mississippi River, I'll trace it out, flows through the U.S. Midwest and discharges into the Gulf of Mexico here, just south of New Orleans, Louisiana. Now, if you go to the interface of the Mississippi River and the Gulf of Mexico, you'll find lots of swampy areas, just like the one in the photograph here that is from that area. And the coal that we combust today started out as all of this plant and woody material in a swamp at the coastline or the intersection of a swampy area and the ocean. So how did nature transform all of this woody material that again is composed of simple carbohydrates, CO2 plus water plus energy equals C6H12O6, so a simple carbohydrate, how did nature transform this environment to coal? It happens on geologic timescales when sea level changes. So now we're looking at the Mississippi River, and I'll trace it out here up at the top. As it winds its way south of New Orleans, the Mississippi River eventually discharges out into the Gulf of Mexico. And the colors that you see here on the right side of the screen, those are colors of sand, silt, and mud or you're really looking at the way that sand, silt, and mud change the aerial photographs as it photographs the ocean water in the Gulf of Mexico. Now all of that swampy material is shown in the pinks and reds right along the coastline. So the way that nature transforms this woody swampy material to coal is by sea level changes that occur on global scales. And there are two words that geologists use to describe sea level change. One word, the first, is transgression, and the second is regression. And I'm going to focus on transgression here, where you can imagine that we have swampy material and we have low sea level. So here would be the Mississippi River flowing from left to right, and we have all of this swampy material along the coastline. And this, as I'm tracing it out, would be where you would actually walk into the ocean. All of this yellow is sand, and then we have water here further out from the shoreline. And as the river discharges all of its sand, silt, and mud, all of that sand, silt, and mud fall to the bottom of the water column in the Gulf of Mexico. Now, this is what we call a regression period of time where sea levels are low. What happens when sea levels are low? How can sea levels be low? That's when we have ice ages where glaciers exist on large parts of the continental land masses. So think about movies you might have seen like Frozen or others where you have massive amounts of ice sheets over North America, over the European continent, over Asia. All of that ice, ultimately the water in that ice, comes from evaporation from the oceans. So as the ice sheets grow larger, ocean levels decline, and sea level regresses away from the shoreline. Now on the bottom, we have the case of transgression, where all of that ice in those glaciers melts, all of that water flows downhill back to the oceans, 
and the, the level of the oceans rises and the oceans transgress up onto that swampy area. And notice what happens then is that all of that sand, silt, and mud moving in the Mississippi River, it will accumulate on top of all of that woody material in the swamps. And as that sand, silt, and mud accumulates on top of that woody material, it buries it under anoxic or oxygen-free conditions. And that's shown here in the sequence of images, left, center, and then to the right, where we start out with swampy material. And as sand, silt, and mud are buried on, are, are added on top of that swampy, planty, woody material, all of that woody material is compressed and it goes through a sequence of changes as a function of being compressed. So the arrow here in red indicates that more sand, silt, and mud is being compacted on top of the woody material. And I just want to focus your eyes on the fact that that woody material then, the same amount of woody material, shrinks as it's compacted. And this happens as a function of time. So when we look at a coal seam, such as the one on the right-hand side over here, with a human for scale, this is a coal seam that's give or take well, probably three or four meters in thickness. When we look at a coal seam, a hundred feet of coal starts out as a hundred, a thousand feet of peat. So a hundred feet of coal starts as a thousand feet of peat, or a ratio of about ten to one. So if we have a swamp that contains lots of woody plant material, and let's say on geologic time scales, we end up with a thousand feet of that swampy material that we refer to as peat. On geologic time scales, it will be compressed to a thickness of about a hundred feet of coal. And there are a number of things that happen during that compression. Among them, the amount of carbon in the coal increases and the amount of water decreases. So again, let's focus on the top. And imagine at stage zero, we've got a swamp with lots of woody material. And on geologic time scales, we have transgression, where sea level rises and sediment is being discharged closer to the shoreline and covering up the swamps. That results in an increase in pressure. And as pressure increases within the earth, it also results in an increase in heat, or think of that as an increase in temperature. So this original cold, woody material here at the shoreline, as it's buried under more and more and more sediment from left to right, it experiences compaction because of increasing pressure, and it experiences heat because increasing compaction and pressure cause the temperature to increase. And on the bottom, we have four different what we call grades of coal. We start out with peat. And as we compact and increase the temperature of peat, nature transforms that to brown coal. And as we continue to compact and heat up brown coal, nature transforms it to subbituminous coal. And with continued addition of heat and pressure, nature transforms that to bituminous coal. And all I want you to see here in these words at the very bottom is from peat to brown coal to subbituminous coal to bituminous coal, Notice that the amount of carbon increases from 60 to 60 to 71 percent, 71 to 77 percent, and 77 to 87 percent. And remember that the combustion reaction that makes coal an energy resource is carbon plus oxygen equals CO2 plus energy. So as we go from left to right, bituminous coal is a higher energy coal than are the other three to its left. Now as carbon content increases, this next row here, volatile matter, think of that as water. And what's occurring is that as the carbon content increases, it's because water is essentially being baked out of the coal. So water goes from close to 50% here in peat to 42 to 29% in bituminous coal. And the ranges of carbon and water here are just an indication of how much variability there is with respect to coal around the world. So just to highlight again, with increasing pressure and temperature, peat is transformed to brown coal, subbituminous coal, bituminous coal. The carbon content increases from left to right, 
which means the energy content increases from left to right, and that's because water decreases from left to right. In the United States, we have a tremendous quantity of coal, both at the surface and below the surface. So if we look at the map here on the, that takes up most of the slide, you can see all of the colored regions. Those represent different types of coal. And there's one that I didn't mention in the previous slide called anthracite. Anthracite is actually the highest grade coal, the highest carbon content. And the United States, we have very little of that. We, have, we, we historically had a lot of that in southwestern Virginia, in central Pennsylvania, and here in parts of Massachusetts up towards New Hampshire. But much of that was mined out in the 17 and 1800s into the 1900s. So just a snapshot to see how much coal there is in the United States. And then a point I want to make, and I'll come back to I, in this lecture, is on the East Coast, we, we have high grades of coal from an energy perspective. So this anthracite and bituminous coal, which in the previous slide I showed you had more carbon content than these three lower grade coals. And I want you to see here that coal in the western states, the Rocky Mountain regions, so New Mexico, Colorado, Arizona, Utah, Wyoming, up into Montana, across into North Dakota and South Dakota, there is some bituminous coal, there's no anthracite, and there is a lot of subbituminous coal and lignite. So the energy content of coal in the western states is lower than the energy content of the coal in the eastern states. So when we think about low-hanging fruit, I'm going to walk through and just give you some examples of how that applies here to coal. So this is a map of the Mid-Atlantic. So here we have Lake Erie at the top and we have Lake Michigan top left. And I just want you, without staring too much at the legend, just see that anything that's stippled through the Appalachian regions and then out here when you get into Indiana and Illinois, what we call geologically the Illinois Basin, there is a lot of coal, and this coal historically outcropped at the surface. So now what I'm playing is the population density in the United States. And again, I showed you in a previous slide in this lecture that the largest number of coal-fired power plants are on the East Coast and the Midwest, and they correlate with population expansion. In the last lecture, I talked about coal-fired locomotives where the coal was combusted and the energy liberated was used to convert water to steam. That steam moved a piston and that piston turns the wheels on a coal-fired locomotive. So when we look at population density in the United States from 1790 through today, we can also imagine that that population density, so-called westward expansion in the 19th century, with westward expansion and then the invention of modern-day coal-fired electric power plants in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. That is what went along with westward expansion as we started to provide electricity to people in cities such as Pittsburgh and Cleveland and Detroit and Toledo and Chicago and St. Louis. With people, with all of those machines that use electricity, came the desire and the demand for electricity and coal-fired power plants were built to produce that electricity. And we can see that when we look at the towns and villages and cities that grew in and around the Appalachian Mountains, where this is a map, we've got Virginia here that takes up most of the bottom, West Virginia, which seceded from Virginia because they supported the Union during the American Civil War, and then Pennsylvania. And again, all I want you to see are all of these colors that indicate coal that outcropped at the surface, meaning coal that we could trip over. And that is what put a lot of areas throughout the Appalachian Mountain on the map. So if we think of the surface here up at the top, this is a geologic map where we've got a house here. And notice the black, all of these black lines that I'm tracing over here that intersect the surface at an angle of somewhere close to 45 degrees. They truly intersected the surface up here top right. So early settlers, European immigrants moving westward, west during westward expansion in the United States would literally trip over these coal seams, as they're commonly called, 
and then they would start mining these coal seams at the surface and then they would build what's labeled here an incline and the incline essentially is an underground tunnel that allows them to continue working down and remember that they can continue working down as long as that coal seam intersected their property at the surface. So this put places on the map throughout the Appalachian Mountains. There are lots of different ways that we mine coal and in this class I'm not going to go into those in detail. I just want you to have an appreciation for how much coal mining has been done in the Appalachian region of the eastern United States. It was the primary source of income in areas of Virginia, West Virginia, Kentucky, Ohio through the 1990s into the 2000s. And this is why it has become so easy to politicize. So I'm going to skip through this for this class. I teach another class, Earth 344, where I go into this in more detail. And I'm going to avoid this for Earth 380 for the current term. So one of the things that we also know has happened in the United States and other developed countries and is happening in developed countries as we speak is regulations that were put into place that reduced workplace fatalities and injuries. And I want to take a minute just to highlight that here with respect to coal. If you look at the right is a column that highlights the year and different congressional acts that started to regulate mining above ground, meaning open pit, and in underground mines. And what you can see here is that in 1891, the first mining regulations were put into effect in the United States. And if we fast forward all the way through to the most recent changes or adaptations to the mine laws that affect coal mining, those were put into place in 2006. Now on the left hand side, the y-axis is the number of fatalities in thousands per year. So 2,000, 4,000, 6,000, 8,000, 10,000, 12,000. And I, I take that back, not per year, in five-year aggregates. And if we look at the period here, give or take 110 years ago, all of the blue are coal fatalities. So these are the number of people who died working in coal mining. And you can see that if we go back 100 years, we were exceeding thousands of people every year dying mining coal. And notice what happens as we progress from the early 1900s through today. The number of people, men and women, who die in coal mines today is effectively close to zero. There are certainly modern tragedies as there was even a few years ago in West Virginia with an underground explosion. But the number of people who die in coal mines has almost approached zero. And why is that? Part of that is technology and ingenuity and engineers who figure out ways to make things safer underground and in open pit mines. But a large part of that is also regulations at the federal level that mandate changes to safety protocols at mines. And I can't understate this. So the big one in my lifetime was in 1977, and it's known as the Mine Safety and Health Act, or MSHA. And MSHA currently regulates every aspect of mining at all types of mines in the United States. It, it regulates, for example, hard hats. Any mine that you go to, the hard hats have to be approved by MSHA to withstand a certain amount of force per unit area or pressure if something were to fall and hit that hard hat. So when we look at coal mining as an example of where regulations work, something we hear a lot about in political circles today that regulations are bad for industry, I don't think anybody would argue that the regulations here have been bad because of the significant positive impact they've had on reducing fatalities of people working in coal mines. I'm not going to give details in the lecture today but I encourage people to meet with me during office hours or look into this on your own. One of the most negative types of mining of coal throughout the world is known as mountaintop removal and it is just as the name might have you imagine. If you look at the photograph on the left, this was a mountain covered in forest and all of that forest is gone. 
It looks very similar to the Oak Teddy copper gold mine in Papua New Guinea. This is in West Virginia. And the reason that all of the trees here were felled and moved is to get access to coal that was close to the surface but did not fully outcrop at the surface. So it almost but did not intersect the surface. And mountaintop removal has left a lot of what environmental groups appropriately refer to as toxic scabs on the landscape throughout the Appalachian Mountains. So what are some challenges with coal? I'm going to talk now about some things that we've already discussed in previous lectures just to remind you of how coal is related to environmental degradation. So here is again another snapshot of part of the Appalachian Mountains in the United States. So Kentucky on the left, Tennessee lower left, Virginia on the right, North Carolina, my home state on the lower right, West Virginia here, and then north of us would be Pittsburgh and north of Kentucky would be Ohio. And I just want to highlight in red the almost 1.2 million acres of land that have been disturbed for the purpose of mining coal by that mountaintop removal. So it's not an insignificant amount of land, 1.2 million acres. And if we look at it in detail in some particular areas of the more than 500 mountains that have been destroyed by mountaintop removal, so again, 500 mountains like this on the left-hand side of your screen. In some counties, such as Wise County, VA, and you don't need to memorize this, but almost 40% of the land area has been impacted by coal mining. We can look at other parts of Virginia, and again, just look here at the number of coal mines. Now, why is this a problem? Because in 1977, that is the year the U.S. Congress signed into law, or our president signed into law after being passed by the U.S. Congress, the Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act. That is the federal body of legislation that requires coal mining companies to reclaim the land after they mine coal, no matter what method they use to mine coal. So when we look at historic coal mines throughout the Appalachian region, the vast majority of those operated before the passage in 1977 of the Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act, which means that there was no reclamation done, and today we live with thousands of mines where meteoric water, which starts out with a pH of about 5.7, it infiltrates and percolates through these abandoned mines. One of the other types of minerals that is commonly found with coal is the sulfide pyrite. And if you remember in a previous lecture, when pyrite interacts with oxygen and slightly acidic rainwater, it makes that water even more acidic. It increases the hydrogen ion concentration. So the pH decreases, the water becomes more acidic, and that leads to what we now know is acid mine drainage, which is a huge problem throughout the Appalachian region. If we then zoom out across the United States, there are close to 50,000 abandoned coal mines in the United States. 50,000. And again, a majority of these are small-scale operations that date back to the 1700s, into the early 1800s, and into the 1900s. There are still many operating coal mines today. But just looking at the red dots, if we look at the Appalachian region, if we look at the Illinois Basin here throughout the Midwest, and then we look at the Rocky Mountain region starting down here in New Mexico and continuing all the way up to the Canadian border, there are 50,000 coal mines that, as I talk, may be producing acid mine drainage. And these represent huge legacy issues for the people that live in those areas of the country. Now, you can look at this on your own time on the bottom here. I provide a link to the Office of Surface Mining Reclamation and Enforcement, which is a branch under the umbrella of the U.S. Department of the Interior. And they categorize all abandoned mines based on either vis visual evidence for environmental degradation now or the potential for environmental degradation in the future. And so if you're interested in this, talk to me or read through the programs online. But do know that there are people with 
the Office of Surface Mining Reclamation Enforcement who work on this, but as we can probably guess, there aren't enough people and there's never enough funding. So a second challenge with coal is that it is incredibly inefficient. So I've shown you now a couple of schematics and I just emphasized first that I'm not going to go through the details of power plants. I just want you to know that when coal comes in, in this case on the schematic, it's on a train and that coal is emptied from the train and combusted here at the power plant. If you imagine the coal shown here being held in someone's hand, imagine coal contains a hundred units of energy. Okay? Think of that as a hundred units of electricity that if you could get all of the energy released by that exothermic combustion reaction, carbon plus oxygen equals CO2 plus energy. If that hundred units of energy, if you could get them all to your house when you plug in your laptop, that would be absolutely 100% efficiency because you have been able to convert all of that exothermic energy to usable energy in the form of electricity that you can plug into but it's actually quite a different scenario in the real world. For a hundred units of energy in coal when we combust them, 62 of those units are lost to heat. So one of the major challenges in coal-fired power plants is the heat that's produced by combustion, 62 percent of that is just lost at the coal-fired power plant. Just poof, it's gone. So then we still now have about, uh, what do we have, 38 units left, okay? So then we have 38 units that enter, or 38 units of energy that enter the transmission lines, and we lose two of those during transmission. And if you've ever been near a high voltage transmission line and you hear the sizzle, that's part of that energy loss, just poof, it's lost to the atmosphere. So we continue to lose energy, and then we have that energy enter our house, and we have the energy that you, is used to power the light bulb. Now we have 36, right? We started with 100, we lost 62, we then lost two more. So now we've got 36 units. And if you plug in a traditional incandescent light bulb, so not a modern light bulb, not, not a, a, a light bulb that you would tend to buy today, an LED, but a traditional incandescent light bulb, they would lose another 34 units of heat 34 units of energy as heat, meaning that only two units of energy would actually be visible to the user of the light bulb. So from purely an energy perspective, they're very inefficient. Now when we use LEDs today, we lose less of that, we lose less of that energy as heat, but nonetheless, the loss of 62 units here at the coal-fired power plant means that more than half of the energy that is contained within those carbon bonds that connect carbon atoms together in coal is lost during combustion. I mentioned pyrite as a, as a common sulfide found with coal and here again is the coal in somebody's hand and if you break that coal open and look at it on a very high powered microscope so here's a scale bar of 300 microns you can see pyrite is intergrown with the coal Pyrite has a formula similar to chalcopyrite, which we talked a lot about. In this case, pyrite is more simple. It doesn't contain copper. It's just iron and sulfur. And when that pyrite reacts, as I mentioned, with acidic meteoric water or rainwater, that will cause the acidity of the water to increase, and that leads to acid rain and leads to acid mine drainage from what you can see in the photograph this is an historic coal mine in the Appalachians and this is water that is percolating in a creek out of that coal mine and the dark reddish brown colors here are a particular bacteria that can thrive in those acidic waters this water is not potable meaning it's not fit for human consumption or animal consumption and so this creek throughout this part of the Appalachian regions then it is contaminating all of the fauna and flora as it flows downstream. And on the right-hand side, we've got a map of an area that I've shown you now a few times in today's lecture. Here's Kentucky, Virginia, West Virginia. So the Appalachian Mountains here is moving from the, the top right to the bottom left. And everything here in red, these are impaired or threatened streams.
So all of these streams that are draining abandoned coal mines are impaired or threatened as acid mine drainage. When you combust coal and you combust pyrite, pyrite also contains other metals. So if you look here at the right hand side of the slide, metals such as nickel and arsenic and mercury and chromium. We talked about lead when we talked about smelting in Sudbury, Ontario and how lead can be returned to the earth in raindrops. All of these metals also return to the surface as part of raindrops. And these metals are present in the emissions from coal-fired power plants because they're contained within pyrite and there is always a certain amount of pyrite that is combusted along with coal. You cannot separate the two before you combust coal. Pyrite also releases sulfur dioxide. So remember, if combustion of coal is carbon plus oxygen equals CO2 plus energy, as we add oxygen to pyrite at very high temperatures during combustion, iron sulfide plus oxygen equals SO2. So we also are releasing SO2 as a byproduct of the combustion of coal in addition to all of these metals. And we've talked in previous lectures about the effect of the release of SO2. These are photographs of the smog that gripped areas of our country such as New York City and Birmingham, Alabama and Los Angeles. And this is a combination of coal-fired power plants and also gases being emitted by the vehicles before we had modern technology that would essentially scrub those gases to reduce the emissions into the atmosphere. I showed you this video in a previous slide and you'll often hear in the media, well do we really know if the combustion of coal releases pollutants? Well this is from an oil field and also contains combustion of coal here shown I'm circling in in black and what we can see is that combustion of coal without any doubt releases SO2 and it's a no-brainer this is middle school chemistry if not elementary school chemistry if coal contains pyrite and pyrite is FES2 and FES2 reacts with oxygen during combustion we know without a doubt that it's going to produce sulfur dioxide so we know that the combustion of coal and sulfides has a negative impact. And we can go back to Richard Nixon here, president in the late 60s, early 70s. And we know that Nixon, for a variety of reasons, is criticized. But among, in my opinion, his claims to fame and among the things that we should fondly remember him for is that for whatever reason, by 1970, he took to the environmental movement and he was able to work with other members of Congress to push through and legislate the Environmental Protection Agency, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and one that I mentioned in a previous lecture that most people would never associate with Richard Nixon, Title IX, and despite the challenges with Title IX, that is something that has been unbelievably important for gender equality in the United States over the last few decades. So here we have this photograph of Nixon signing the Clean Air Act, which again imposed federal regulations on coal-fired power plants. And remember at the time, if you went to the Concordia Cemetery in Chicago and you lived in that area in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, you saw the degradation of these statues. And we knew without any doubt, unequivocally, that the degradation of the statue on the right that was fully exposed to the atmosphere, that degradation is caused by acid rain. And acid rain, the sulfur in that acid rain, and the increased hydrogen ion concentration, that sulfur comes from pyrite that is combusted with coal in coal-fired power plants to produce electricity. You've seen these maps just to highlight what we're looking at. I showed you that GIF the animation of westward migration as the US population increased from right to left, east to west. And again, I showed you all those coal-fired power plants that dominated the east coast and the Midwest, out to the Mississippi River, parts of Illinois, Kansas, Missouri. If you look at these images in 1990, coal still dominated electricity production in the eastern and midwestern parts of the United States, and scientists not just scientists, the average public 
came to understand and appreciate the relationship between coal-fired electricity and the low pH and high sulfate ion concentrations in water. We did legislate emissions reductions. We did figure out how to capture that sulfur dioxide. So this is something you've seen before where we have these showers and they spray a solution of calcium carbonate which reacts with sulfur dioxide to produce a mineral calcium sulfate that sinks to the bottom of the tower and that pulls sulfur out of the waste stream but I'll highlight it does nothing for CO2. CO2 is still emitted out of the waste stream. And we saw this before as well. Sulfur dioxide, I highlighted in one of the previous lectures, this is the metals processing or smelting. The impact of the Clean Air Act in 1970 was to drop sulfur dioxide levels. The second Clean Air Act amendments here in 1990, we saw a slight uptick and then we see a significant decline in my lifetime and your lifetime. Now remember, part of that in the United States has to be the work of the regulations because we certainly don't produce coal-fired electricity in China and ship it to the United States. When we look at the decrease in sulfate ion concentration here on the right and the increase in pH, and remember an increase in pH is a good thing because low pH is acidic and now we have more neutral or near neutral pH here throughout the Midwest and East Coast of the United States. This is the specific result of that legislation, the Clean Air Act and the Clean Air Act amendments that required scrubbers at all of those coal-fired power plants in the United States. We looked at this previously. This is the SO2 emissions, which we can see starting around 1850 started to increase and then I would say skyrocketed in the 1900s and we start to see a decline up here in the top right in the world. We see the U.S. declining after the Clean Air Act and Clean Air Act amendments. Now, how does that relate to the types of coal in the United States? And this is where I want to make sure everybody can see some of how this gets politicized. So if we think of this map again, I showed you the types of coal here. The East Coast has higher grades of coal, meaning the East Coast and the Midwest have higher grades of coal, more carbon, they also have higher sulfur concentrations. Coal in the Rocky Mountain regions, especially coal here in Wyoming, that coal is lower grade, meaning lower carbon concentrations, but it has lower sulfur concentrations. So if we think of West Coast coal, meaning all of this coal in the Rocky Mountain regions, it's got low sulfur, whereas East Coast coal has high sulfur. So remember that one of the things the Clean Air Act and the Clean Air Act amendments did is they required, in this case, coal-fired power plants or the companies that operated the coal-fired power plants to reduce their sulfur emissions. Now, one of the ways that you can do that is by scrubbing that sulfur, that reaction calcium carbonate plus SO2 equals calcium sulfate, and then you produce a mineral that you can actually sell to produce gypsum drywall. But the other way that you can reduce sulfur emissions is by using coal with less sulfur. So after the Clean Air Act was signed by Richard Nixon in 1970, what we see in the United States is the amount of coal that was being mined in the East Coast and Midwest started to decrease, and the amount of coal being mined in the Rocky Mountain states or the western part of the country started to increase. Even though this coal in the Rocky Mountain regions has lower energy density. It has much lower sulfur. So as you're producing coal, as you're producing electricity from coal from the Rocky Mountain regions, you need more coal, but you produce a lot less sulfur. And what companies started doing is they started using a lot more coal from west of the Mississippi River. So we have coal here on the bottom from 1950 through 2013. And I just want you to know the y-axis is how much coal was produced. And we've got the coal from east of the Mississippi. So think the Illinois Basin and the Appalachian Mountains. We can see that it does grow or sort of declines a little bit here in the 70s. And then we see it grow through the 80s and 90s. And then we see it dropping significantly. And what really is happening to cause it to drop here is the tremendous growth of coal production west of the Mississippi. 
Now, one of the things we know going back to 1970 into the early 1970s is there was very little coal production here in the Rocky Mountain regions, and that's because the energy density of that coal was lower than coal from the East Coast and Midwest. But as a result of the Clean Air Act, what we started to see in the 1970s and through today is the amount of coal from what we call on the bottom here surface mines increased dramatically. So what we're looking at here is again a time frame from 1950 to 2012 or 2013 on the bottom. Total coal production is on the left y-axis and then on the right hand side is the percent or the fraction, the proportion of coal from underground mines relative to surface mines. And what we know by the 1960s and 70s is all of the coal mines in the Appalachian region were all underground coal mines, whereas all of the coal mines in the Rocky Mountain regions are surface mines, meaning the coal intersects the surface, it's low-hanging fruit, we trip over it, and therefore it's much easier and cheaper to mine, and because it's easier and cheaper and it has lower sulfur, the coal from these surface mines just took off like a rocket ship in our lifetimes. And we see that economically having huge impacts for different parts of the country. If we look here at a map of Wyoming, so here is Wyoming, the state, title bottom. If we look at Wyoming, all of the coal in black represents surface deposits. And these are massive coal deposits that literally sit at the surface. And you could go out there with a gardening shovel and dig into them and start combusting that coal. So this is coal that's low sulfur, easy to mine, cheap to mine, and therefore it started dominating coal production in the United States. And you can see that here in this histogram for Wyoming, where if we go back to the late 1960s, the Clean Air Act is signed here in 1970, notice coal production just takes off, right, where production is on the y-axis. So how does this contribute to politics? One of the things that came along with coal mining is the high paying jobs. And if we look here at wages over time, this is for the state of Wyoming, 2001 to 2015, the average earnings statewide are in blue and the average earnings for coal mine are in red. And all I want you to see if you look at the numbers is you could make almost three times the amount of money working in a coal mine as you could working in any other job in the state of Wyoming. So now we start to see a radical shift in the economics of states such as Wyoming and others in the Rocky Mountain region because they are mining coal. And this is a figure where all I need you to see on this figure is that all of that coal being mined in Wyoming is being exported to other states around the country. Depending on the year, Wyoming sends their coal to as many as 34 or 35 different states, including the states of Wisconsin, Minnesota, South Dakota, North Dakota, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan. So all of these other states, all the way including down here to Florida, we have coal mined in Wyoming being shipped elsewhere, being exported. Wyoming and these states are mining states. So if we look at the y-axis is a reflection of how important mining is to the state economy. And this is reflected here in the percentage of mining to the gross domestic product relative to the total state gross domestic product. So just think of zero as mining has no impact. And as we increase percentage, mining has a larger impact. And all I want you to see is that in some states, such as Wyoming, mining impacts more than 20% of the economy of the state. And then we see Alaska, West Virginia, North Dakota, Oklahoma, New Mexico, Texas, Montana, Louisiana. Guess how each of these states voted in the United States presidential election in 2016? They all voted for current President Donald Trump. And he capitalized on this by visiting those states wearing a hard hat in, approved by M. Shah, and he got people fired up that he digs coal. And he convinced people 
that he was going to bring coal mining back in all of these states, Virginia, Kentucky, West Virginia, Ohio. It's not going to happen. On the flip side, we had Hillary Clinton, who won the popular vote and lost because of the Electoral College. And this is a quote taken out of context, where she was quoted as saying, we're going to put a lot of coal miners and coal companies out of business. If you actually listen to the speech in which that quote was pulled, she then talks about economic empowerment and a variety of programs that she would introduce into these regions where coal jobs have been declining for decades for reasons that we'll get to. Other issues with respect to coal. Mercury. So if we combust pyrite, which produces sulfur, which leads to acid rain, mercury is a metal that we know unequivocally is toxic for humans. If you are a female student listening to the lecture and you choose to have a child or you know someone who chooses to have a child, one of the things that your doctor will discuss with you is the need to reduce consumption of different types of fish because mercury bioaccumulates up the trophic chain or up the food chain. And we know that mercury is an element present in pyrite. We know that the dilution to the, the, the we know that the old adage dilution is solution to pollution is wrong. Mercury is released. And we know that if we look at the map here, for example, of the United States, this is the deposition of mercury back onto the surface from rainwater. Just like we talked about lead in Sudbury, Ontario, all of this mercury comes from combustion of coal. And when that combustion of coal releases mercury into the atmosphere, mercury falls back to the surface of oceans, lakes, streams, and that mercury is then consumed by fish and it works its way up the food chain. And we know this today. So we know around the world, because we have measured the concentration of mercury in a wide variety of fish, including tuna. This is from Consumer Reports a few years ago, and it highlights or it educates the consumer about how much tuna is safe to eat per week based on the average mercury concentration in that tuna. So on the bottom here is your weight or my weight in pounds. So I'm somewhere out here. And so this tells me how much albacore tuna and light tuna I can eat over a given amount of time per week and still have low enough mercury concentrations that they are not perceived as toxic by the medical community. One of the faculty in our department, Earth and Environmental Sciences, Joel Bloom, who was just elected to the National Academy of Sciences for, um, for many reasons, among them is a study that he led a few years ago where they went to Hawaii and they fished offshore and they caught fish at different trophic levels. So just think really small fish up to really big fish. And then they measured the amount of mercury in the fish as humans would consume them. And without giving you all of the details, mercury, which is the only element that exists as a liquid at room temperature, mercury has a number of different isotopes and you can use the ratio of different isotopes of mercury to actually fingerprint the source of the mercury in the fish. And what Joel and his colleagues were able to do is they were able to capture fish here off the coast of Hawaii, and they were able to fingerprint the source of mercury was combustion of coal in India, which makes sense because we know that the winds from Asia blow from west to east across into California and other parts of the United States, Mexico and Canada. We know that China, as of the last few years, has produced more than half of their electricity from coal, and India more than two-thirds of their electricity from coal. And that mercury that is released during the combustion of coal ultimately finds its way into the Pacific Ocean. And Joel and his colleagues were able to measure the isotopes of mercury in those fish off of Hawaii and show that Dilution is not the solution to pollution. In fact, the atmosphere is like a giant conveyor belt, and anything combusted in Asia finds its way around the entire world. So I encourage you to read about this on your own time. There's lots that's been written even in the popular press about their study. And just to highlight, it's not a one-off in fish off of Hawaii. We see this around the world. So this is a map and histogram 
where people measured mercury contents in women on remote islands, literally in the middle of nowhere for many of these islands. And what they were able to measure are high enough concentrations of mercury in places where there is no coal-fired combustion. There are no coal-fired power plants. The only plausible explanation for the mercury in these women in the middle of nowhere is that the atmosphere is being contaminated by mercury from coal combustion around the world and that coal combustion producing mercury the mercury is getting into the oceans into the fish humans eat fish and that that mercury bioaccumulates up the food chain and again lots of slides built in here just to emphasize again dilution is not the solution to pollution so this is a sort of poorly um, pulled map from Google Images, but this is mercury emissions, and all I want you to see are the colors. This is global mercury emissions. So what you can see is around the world today, especially in India and China, where we have a proliferation of coal-fired electricity over my lifetime, you can see the amount of mercury has increased significantly. We see, that's in, we see this also in parts of Africa, where there are no coal-fired power plants. Remember earlier I highlighted Africa? There's one coal-fired power plant in West Africa. There are several in Southern Africa. There are none in this part of Central and Sub-Saharan Africa, such that all of this mercury can only be accounted for by emissions of mercury elsewhere across ocean basins. And we see this also in soils. So these are maps for soils at different depths. So remember with lead from the smelting at Sudbury, Canada, these are soils, even in permafrost, where down as many as 300 centimeters, we can see high concentrations of mercury. So last few slides, I just want to make sure when I use this concept, low-hanging fruit, in the United States, we are seeing a huge decline in the amount of coal combustion for the purpose of electricity. And that is strictly driven by the fact that today natural gas is the cheapest way to produce electricity on a mass scale, something I'll talk about in the next lecture. But I just want you to see if you look at the numbers here, the numbers are the amount of coal in each one of these regions. So just think of the total amount of coal, and these are in billions of tons. When we look at the United States, we're combusting less coal because of economics. But when we look at countries such as Russia, China, India, India has, depending on whose estimates you believe, as many as a few hundred million people who lack consistent 24-7, 365 access to electricity, India has lots of low-grade brown coal that is sulfur-rich. And India is building lots of coal-fired power plants, as China did in the 80s, 90s. So a big concern globally, again, is that if combustion of coal anywhere on the planet results in contamination everywhere on the planet, there's a lot of emphasis now on the part of environmental groups and government agencies to work with China, India, and other developing countries to not build more coal-fired infrastructure, but to use renewable forms of energy in some cases, even the Obama administration worked with India to try and secure financing for nuclear power plants to reduce the overall amount of coal combustion. So we've seen the world has declined, and then we see an uptick in your lifetime in terms of SO2 emissions. The U.S. emissions declined, and much of that was because of a combination of technological innovation where we could scrub SO2, and also pollution transfer to China where we started manufacturing the products that we use there. When we look around the world, we see coal increasing in terms of overall use. So the International Energy Administration, the IEA up here, they track every year global trade consumption, so imports and exports. And all I want you to see is that the numbers are going up. The individual numbers are not what matters. It's the aggregate number, and that number tells us that the developing world is choosing coal to build their electricity infrastructure. And you can read a lot about this on your own time. 
This is an article that highlights growth of coal in the developing world or non-OECD. So this was a term I used in one of the previous lectures, Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. The OECD is a group of the 32 wealthiest countries and all others are considered non-OECD. And what all of the Energy Information Administration economists, these are economists who make these predictions, what they predict is that global coal production will hold steady through 2040. And if you are someone who believes that we need to transition away from fossil fuels and the majority of this coal is being used to produce electricity, and you've now done your modules where you can demonstrate that solar and wind are viable and in fact less expensive, then this is perhaps something for you to consider as you move on beyond college to get involved with. We see China, they are expected to drop coal consumption. And again, why? Well, Simon Kuznets and his Kuznets curve, he tells us that China has hit their turning point. And China wants to transition to a service economy. And a service economy means less manufacturing, less coal, less smog, less environmental degradation, and growth of the middle class, which is what China has done in your generation. India, all of the forecasts are that India will increase coal consumption, and that is because they want to provide a middle-class lifestyle and access to electricity for all of the citizens in India, equal to what they see is the average amount of electricity consumption in the developed world. And remember, it's not just electricity, it's everything that goes along with electricity, which means heat, cooling, lights, and when you increase the amount of lighting in areas, especially at night, sociologists have demonstrated you decrease domestic violence, you decrease violence in toto, and so it's all of the things that come with an increase in electricity. Per capita income increases, so India wants what we have. We know that electricity generation will continue to increase, so these are data where from a baseline of 2010, we can project out to 2040 that as electricity increases, coal is predicted to either hold steady or to increase. And a world without fossil fuels, we need solar in yellow, wind in green. We need those along possibly with nuclear and more hydroelectric in blue and red. We need these to overtake electricity production from natural gas in this lighter blue and coal in orange. So if we want to prevent all of the negative impacts of coal combustion in countries such as India, and we know the negative impacts because we've studied them in the United States and the European Union, we have in your lifetime seen the impacts of coal combustion in China. The only way to do that is to work in partnership to provide other ways of providing electricity to the masses throughout the developing world so that they can avoid what we already know is part of our own lived experience. And then lastly, I haven't talked about climate change. I said in the last lecture, I'm not gonna give an entire lecture on this in this class, but just know that CO2 emissions are also an irreversible product of combustion carbon plus oxygen equals CO2. CO2 emissions are not regulated. Again, something that has become politicized. A lot of people who are opposed to what Obama did during his presidency in terms of implementing new regulations and the Paris Accord, just know that in the United States, CO2 is not regulated. It never has been. And right now there are a variety of proposals you worked on this a bit in Module 8 when you looked at internal and external costs, but something the media commonly gets wrong is they will blame Obama for regulating CO2. He did not do that, and right now there are no regulations for CO2. So that was coal. The next lecture I'll talk about oil and natural gas.